Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Economics of Health and Education. In lesson 2 of week 8, we will focus on the contours of education policy. We will discuss some of the uh, theories and uh, frameworks that need to be understood in the context of education policy. And uh, we will also focus on India's education policy beginning from the 1950s onwards when the thrust on uh, policy making began with respect to education in India. Uh, we will not focus on the pre-independence period, uh, but provide uh, much attention to what has uh, happened and how has uh, the education policy of India evolved right from the 1950s onwards. Now, these are the two important uh, uh, aspects that we will cover in today's lesson. We will first try to understand a framework uh, to discuss education policy. Uh, matters regarding education policy like health policy are vast and uh, there are uh, various stakeholders involved in the discussion of education policy. There are various frameworks that need discussion uh, in education policy. However, in today's lesson because we want to focus our attention on India's education policy, we will try to understand the contours that have uh, influenced education policy in India in the past few decades. And finally, we will focus on the education policy in India. Now, there are three major issues when we uh, want to understand uh, any policy framework, be it education or uh, health, uh, particularly in the context of government interventions in uh, education in social sector policies. Uh, the three uh, major questions are how is it funded, how is it provided and how is it regulated. Now, uh, there are no easy answers to these uh, questions. In this class, we will try to uh, understand uh, some of the uh, basic dimensions surrounding these important questions of funding, provision and regulation, uh, particularly in India's context. Now, let me begin by discussing what are the drivers of policy making in education. Uh, if we think in terms of uh, frameworks, uh, we can think of neoliberalism and classical economic liberalism being one of the dominant uh, frameworks in the realm of policy discourse today. Uh, now, the presupposition of both of these schools, neoliberalism and classical economic liberalism is that market is the best institution to allocate resources with commitments to less affairism or less uh, government intervention, basically limiting the role of the state in the economy. And uh, these uh, uh, dominant uh, policy frameworks, neoliberalism and classical economic liberalism uh, believes in the pursuit of self-interest by individuals and uh, the pursuit of self-interest by individuals uh, mostly aligns with the best interest of the society or so it is believed. So, individuals and individual self-interests become responsive to policies so as to build a competitive economy. The idea of neoliberalism and classical economic liberalism has held sway as far as uh, education policies are concerned in many countries across the world including India and therefore, it would be appropriate to begin uh, understanding the drivers of policy making in education uh, within the uh, framework of neoliberalism and classical economic liberalism. Now, within these uh, frameworks of neoliberalism, there are two important theories that have mostly been uh, used by economists in the context of education uh, policy making uh, in many countries across the world. One is public choice theory and the other is uh, the social contract uh, theory, the contracts theory and uh, we will also focus today on these uh, two theories. So, public choice theory scholars such as the British economist, uh, economic historian E. G. West have applied public choice theory to the study of uh, state education and provided a challenge to the excessive state support to public education at a time when uh, British uh, public education was heavily subsidized. Uh, scholars such as uh, E. G. West uh, came forward to provide a challenge to the excessive state support provided to public education. They laid stress on the freedom of the individual, particularly in the context of the individual parent who is taking decision regarding uh, education investments of their children, uh, whose interests can be best advanced and sustained by the markets instead of by the state. Uh, 
British economic historians such as West severely criticized the British system of education which was heavily subsidized by considering the role of market as inadequate and hence argued that they be replaced. He argued that the monopoly of education by the state has severely limited parental freedom and adversely affected quality of education. They used public choice theory to critique state provided education and argued for more uh, privatization and the use of school vouchers to introduce competition into the education system. So, what exactly is public choice theory in the context of education? Very briefly put, public choice theory provides a framework for understanding the role of the state in education policy by focusing on the self-interested behavior of various stakeholders which would include policy makers uh, such as politicians, bureaucrats, voters and many other interest groups. So, the public choice theory critiques the state's role in education as potentially inefficient and influenced by rent seeking behavior. I will presently explain what these concepts of inefficiency and rent seeking behavior in the context of public choice theory refers to, uh, but the theory in itself critiques the state's role in education as being inefficient and influenced by rent seeking behavior and therefore they call for market oriented reforms such as privatization, competition and decentralization to improve efficiency. Uh, however, the public choice theory also recognizes the need for the state to play a role in ensuring equity in education, balancing the trade-offs between efficiency and social justice. So, what does inefficiency in the context of state's role in education refer to here? Uh, it refers to a critique of public education as a monopoly. So, for example, state education as a monopoly can be argued like this that public choice theory can critiques the state's role in education by comparing public education systems to monopolies which are often less efficient and responsive than competitive market. So, they argue that when the state monopolizes education, it reduces incentives for innovation and improvement. There may also be accountability issues in the context of excessive intervention of the government in the social sector such as education. Uh, and because without competition, public schools may lack accountability leading to lower quality of uh, educational outcomes. So, public choice advocates for policies that introduce accountability measures such as performance based funding and standardized testing. In fact, in most uh, private schools uh, including government schools uh, across the country today, we find various performance based measures that have been introduced as, as a measure of accountability. Now, what does rent seeking behavior uh, mean in the context of public choice theory and education? Uh, two uh, points need to be highlighted. One is influence of interest groups and how interest groups engage in rent seeking behavior. So, public choice theory emphasizes the role of interest groups such as teachers unions, private school associations and education companies in shaping education policy. So, these groups lobby for policies that benefit their members which may not always as, uh, align with the broader public interest. Uh, similarly, these groups may engage in rent seeking behavior, for example, uh, uh, trying to secure government benefits uh, such as subsidies, favorable regulations or funding without providing equivalent benefits to society. For example, a teachers union might lobby for higher salaries or reduced accountability measures which could lead to higher costs without corresponding improvements in education quality. So, uh, within the framework of neoliberalism, public choice theory advances the idea of less interference of the state in provision of education and more market oriented reforms so as to bring in more innovation and competition uh, based upon performance based uh, uh, measurements or uh, other efficiency uh, parameters. The other uh, theory that has held sway in the context of uh, market oriented reforms in education is what can be called agency theory and uh, transaction uh, cost economics uh, in the context of education economics. So, neoliberal policies in pursuit of uh, reforms in education have suggested institutional restructuring uh, located in the management principles of agency theory and transaction cost economics. Uh, now, the uh, transaction cost economics as a framework was developed by the American economist Oliver Williamson. 
uh, wherein transaction cost economics focuses on the costs of economic transactions and how they influence organizational structures. In education, transaction cost economics is applied to understand the costs of delivering education, organizing schools and managing educational resources. Now, what are these transaction costs that need to be understood in the context of uh, education? These basically include costs of negotiating, monitoring and enforcing contracts as well as the costs of coordination between different entities involved in education. In the context of education, they may include administrative costs of managing schools, negotiating contracts with teachers because most teachers are on contractual basis hired or coordinating among different levels of government such as the um, district level governance structures, the state level governing structures and so on. Now, how do transaction costs influence decision of education provision? It helps to decide whether education services needs to be provided by the government or it needs to be outsourced. So, whether a government or school district should directly provide educational services that is make those services or outsource them to private providers or, or buy those services. So, for example, high transaction costs might lead to the decision of providing those services uh, uh, in-house, while low transaction costs might encourage outsourcing of uh, services. Uh, there are also issues regarding the asset uh, that uh, we are considering in the context of education. Uh, certain investments like specialized training for teachers are very specific to a particular context and may not be easily transferable. So, high asset specificity can increase transaction costs and thus affect decisions about how education services are to be provided. So, if uh, specialized uh, teacher training requires to be given in within the education system, then uh, probably the governments might want to open up more specialized uh, training centers as it is very cost intensive and uh, may not be possible to be uh, bought from private sources. Uh, similarly, governance structures also add on to transaction costs, different governance structures are adopted to minimize transaction costs. For example, a government might choose to operate schools directly or contract out certain services like school lunches or transportation and so on. So, this in a nutshell is how transaction costs are used or transaction cost theory is used to analyze education services and the decision regarding whether education services need to be provided by the government or need to be outsourced is taken. In the past uh, weeks, we have studied that uh, school education being a merit good is largely a public responsibility and higher education being a quasi public good uh, depends to a large extent on what are the uh, externalities generated and based upon the extent of externalities generated, uh, the decision regarding funding of higher education is to be made. Now, in the current socio-economic context, uh, we do understand that almost all nations face fiscal constraints, particularly when it comes to budget allocation within the various sectors, uh, more specifically to the layers of higher education, whether it is technical education, social sciences education, sciences education and so on. And fiscal constraints and poor governance emphasize uh, value for money, relevance and accountability in public higher education. So, the private sector is expected to infuse competitive spirit, compete in global knowledge economy by securing students and funding at the global level. So, the important issue is the public private divide in higher education when the boundary is being redefined and rearticulated. Now, within the neoliberal framework of policy making, the role of government is redefined uh, with regard to regulation and provision of public goods such as uh, education and assigning a greater role to private sector. So, setting up of new institutions which specialize in different disciplines and subject areas through public private partnerships and private funding are some of the examples in which education is being uh, provided in the current socio-economic context. Now, while we are discussing uh, neoliberalism and classical economic liberalism within the realm of uh, public education or delivery of education services, particularly in the context of uh, nation states uh, today, it is also important to understand the state education relationship. Uh, market oriented reforms have been initiated in the education sector, but within this context what is the state education relationship also needs some attention. Uh, 
Now, education systems in most nations, as I just discussed, have moved from state controlled regimes to market based decentralized systems with the growing participation of the private sector. So, private sector education uh, services have uh, boomed in a very big way. And there are three major institutions of social coordination that needs to be understood within this context, which is the state, the market and the community. And there exists a complex set of interactions among these three coordinating institutions with regard to three governing activities of funding, provision and regulation. So, um, if we have to put it in the form of a matrix, it would show like this, where there are governance activities and there are coordination, uh, uh, coordinating institutions, the state market and the community and the governance activities being funding, regulation and provision. Education reforms have to strike a balance between the governance activities of funding, regulation, provision and coordinating institutions of state, market and community. And a fully state controlled or a non-state controlled mechanism are extremes and that cannot be envisaged. So, in terms of uh, drivers of education policy, what we have discussed is that in the current socio-economic context of uh, different countries across the world including India, neoliberalism and classical economic liberalism hold sway as far as education policy design is concerned, which has uh, asked for uh, less and less interference of the government in education services and government's role has or state's role has been relegated to uh, regulation and uh, more and more services are being provided by the private sector uh, by uh, ushering in uh, market based reforms, uh, particularly in the context of performance based uh, measurements and various other efficiency parameters. In this context, as far as uh, economics of education policy is concerned, public choice theory and uh, the transaction cost theory provide us some uh, direction as to how management principles are being utilized in the context of the education sector and uh, how efficiency and market based innovations are being uh, ushered in uh, in the form of education services uh, delivery. Now, in the second part of the lecture, I will give a brief outline about how um, the uh, policy of education has evolved in the context of India. We will uh, start from the 1950s onwards. Now, in India, the spirit of federalism uh, holds sway as far as education policies are concerned. The national government provides the larger contours of how education is to be provided. The implementation takes place at the state level. So, uh, what I have done in today's lecture is to identify some of the important uh, committees, commissions and policy recommendations that need to be borne in mind when we are discussing education policy. So, let us begin with the Secondary Education Commission of 1952-53 which is also known as the Mudaliar Commission uh, which was set up under the chairmanship of Dr. A. Mudaliar, the Vice Chancellor of Madras University and this commission had far reaching effect on Indian education. This commission had prepared a questionnaire dealing with different aspects of Indian education and sent it out to various educational experts, teachers and educational institutions in India and information was collected based on their replies. The commission took an extensive tour of various parts of India and acquired first hand accounts of various problems in Indian secondary education and the report was submitted in 1953, uh, nearly a year after the commission was set up in 1952. Uh, the some of the aims of the secondary education commission uh, was uh, to produce ideal citizens with civic responsibility and spirit of sacrifice, develop capacity for earning money, secondary education should impart skills that allow a livelihood, uh, quality of leadership and to develop human virtues. So, the focus of secondary education uh, was on producing ideal citizens. So, it uh, laid a lot of stress on a civic responsibility and spirit of sacrifice as far as uh, the education system is concerned. Some of the important recommendations of the Mudaliar Commission uh, with regard to secondary education was that uh, secondary education should be of 7 years for children from 11 to 17 years of age. 
there would be three years of lower secondary education and four years of higher secondary education and it suggested an end to intermediate colleges and merge class 11 with secondary schools and class 12 with BA courses and degree courses should be of uh, three years. One year pre-university course for high school students uh, was started to enter university and students who passed pre-university courses were allowed to enter professional courses. The Mudalier Commission also promoted vocational education, uh, technical institutes uh, were to be opened near factories so that students can take up practical training. For teacher education, uh, it introduced two years uh, courses for non-graduates and one year for graduates. There was a lot of focus on teacher training and also that teacher trainees should receive training in one or more various co-curricular activities. Now, uh, in the context of uh, education policy, uh, the uh, Kothari Commission which laid the foundation for national education policy, the first national education policy needs a lot of emphasis. Uh, it was called the National Education Commission and was formed in 1964 and this commission uh, was set up to provide a very comprehensive review of education in the country and explore all its weaknesses. So, this uh, commission for the first time was entrusted upon the responsibility of coming up with the uh, first national education policy of the country. Uh, within the period of 1964 to 66, the commission interviewed 9000 educationists, scientists, scholars and administrators and came up with a very comprehensive review of the education system. Uh, there were many working groups and task forces uh, which were uh, formed to focus on specific issues like women's education, uh, pre-primary education and also on a specific aspect or level of education like primary education, adult education, education administration and so on. And as a result of the Kothari Commission report, uh, various reforms were initiated in the context of education administration in the country including education services and so on. So, what were the important recommendations of the Kothari Commission? First was provision of free and compulsory education for children aged 6 to 14 years of age. A three language formula was introduced with a view to national integration. The commission recommended teaching three languages at the state level which would include Hindi, English and a regional language which sort of um, was aimed at national integration by uh, connecting uh, the regions of India with the uh, uh, national uh, territory. Instead of a 3 plus 4 secondary education model, this commission recommended 10 plus 2, 3 patent for education in the country. Uh, 10 years of uh, primary, upper primary and high school, 2 years of higher secondary education and 3 years of graduation for a bachelor's degree. This commission also provided heightened emphasis on social inequalities by stressing on women's education and education of backward classes suggesting setting up of special schools for them. Uh, it also recommended starting schools of uh, education in universities, treatment of education as an independent academic discipline and uh, BA and MA courses in education. Uh, it established Indian education service along in the lines of the Indian administrative service, standardization and revision of pay scales for teaching, non-teaching and administrative staff and minimum pay levels for different locations was also introduced. It also recommended importantly minimization of national holidays uh, by increasing the number of instructional days in a year and advocating for elimination of holidays on religious occasions, establishment of state boards for teacher education in each, each state. It also uh, had special emphasis on science and mathematics education which are closely linked to the prosperity of the nation. The uh, Kothari Commission laid the foundation for the national education policy of 1968 and it had a profound impact on uh, political will towards education and based on these recommendations the NPE 1968 was laid out and the road map uh, laid out by this report set out the policy positions for education on a national scale. So, there was emphasis on every child up to the age of 14 receiving free and compulsory education and reducing the rate of dropouts, adoption of the 10 plus 2 plus 3 education system, the three language formula uh, with focus on multilingualism, uh, 
introduction of a national curriculum for all schools to promote standardization and national integration. Special attention was given on social justice in education with additional provisions for education of women, SCs and STs and greater emphasis on science and mathematics education. Some more policy positions from the NPE 1968 included production of books, standardized books. So, NPE 1968 uh, criticized frequent changes in books and high price of books. So, therefore, it recommended special attention uh, regarding books in regional languages for all students. The commission also recommended uh, that in sight of past experiences, new universities should only be established after adequate funding has been provided. So, uh, greater focus was provided on funding of universities. It advocated for more attention to postgraduate courses and strengthening centers for advanced studies. So, the National Policy on Education of 1968 laid the contours of higher education policy in India by focusing on university education and strengthening advanced studies center groups. Uh, similarly, uh, very uh, significantly correspondence courses uh, was also introduced. The policy suggested developing part-time education and correspondence courses which will have same status as full-time courses on a large scale for university and school students, teachers, workers, etc. So, the focus was on uh, education uh, so, so that it can have, um, uh, have strong connections with the employment of the workforce as well. There were certain disadvantages of the 1968 national policy on education. Uh, one was that education was still a state subject in 1968 and it was uh, difficult to enforce the policy on a national level. It was only later in the 1970s that education became a part of the concurrent list. Uh, while the policy provided broad guidelines and a vision, it lacked a detailed plan for implementation. And there were no specific measures uh, to ensure equitable access to education for disadvantaged groups despite uh, the policy prioritizing on uh, disadvantaged groups. Uh, it was also adopted during a politically turbulent period and thus it received less attention than many other important policies. And there was a relative scarcity of resources for effective implementation of the policy as well. In uh, 1976, uh, the uh, National Policy on Education uh, 1986 contours were being discussed. Uh, during the emergency, the 42nd Amendment to the Indian Constitution had brought five subjects including education from the state list to the concurrent list. And as a result, the center was in a position to accept greater national responsibility for education as well as legally enforcing its policy. So, it was in this context that a renewed national policy on education was adopted in 1986 and NPE 1986 was also broadly based on the recommendations of the Kothari Commission, but was more comprehensive and detailed compared to the 1968 national policy on education. So, the 1986 education policy was the second and one of the most important policy documents that came up in the 1980s. and had repercussions on the Indian education system right through the period of the last uh, 30 years or so. So, what were some of the landmark policy positions of the uh, National uh, Policy on Education of 1986? First is that it laid a greater emphasis, even greater emphasis than the 1968 policy on removal of education disparities and social justice for women and disadvantaged groups like SCs and STs. It communicated the intent to create a national system of education uh, which implied um, that up to a given level all students irrespective of location, sex, caste, creed, ethnicity shall have access to an education of comparable quality and standards. It specifically delegated responsibility to institutions like national institutions like National Council of Education Research, NCERT, National Institute of Education Planning and Administration, NEPA, National Council of Teacher Education, University Grants Commission, All India Council of Technical Education, Indian Council of Medical Research, Indian Council of Agricultural Research in implementing the vision and objectives of the education policy.
Note that the 72nd amendment after providing a national direction to uh, education as a policy matter, a lot of delegation of responsibility started taking place to these nationalized institutions such as NCRT, NEPA or National Council of Teacher Education or UGC and AICTA which actually provided a nationalized move to uh, the kind of education that was to be provided by the country. Uh, early childhood care and education was one of the important uh, policy focus of the NP 1986. Uh, the NP 1968 also mentioned about pre-primary education as a component of education, but it was not given due importance. The NP 1986 put emphasis on early childhood care and education, particularly for first generation learners. You would see later in the national policy of education of 2020. Uh, that early childhood care and education has come back in a very big way. Uh, so, the uh, vision that was seen for early childhood care and education in the 1960s and 1980s uh, is trying to be secured in the national policy of education, the recent education policy of 2020. So, the early childhood care education uh, policy was to be provided in an integrated manner primarily through the ICDS services which was established in 1970s and there was greater emphasis on universal enrollment and universal retention up to 14 years of age. It was the first national education policy to emphasize a child centric and activity based approach to learning and a total exclusion of corporal punishment. Uh, this was one of the highlights of the 1986 policy. Uh, where there was a total exclusion of corporal punishments in schools and uh, focus on activity based learning and uh, engaging children in classrooms through various kinds of activities. Vocational education was also proposed as a part of uh, 1986 policy that uh, was to be offered at the plus 2 stage of secondary education and vocational courses should cover 10 percent of higher secondary students by the year 1995 and 25 percent by the year 2000. So, vocational education goals were set up in the 1986 education policy. It encouraged the establishment of autonomous departments and colleges according to UGC directives and suggested flexibility in teaching methods by incorporating audiovisual uh, methods and electronic equipment in classrooms. Open university and distance education was established by the opening up of uh, the Indira Gandhi National Open University. And so, the NP 1986 assigned responsibility of coordinating the distance learning system across India to IGNO and subsequently various state governments also started opening up distance learning courses as part of their open uh, university initiatives. Some of the important consequences of the 1986 national policy on education also needs uh, emphasis here. Uh, the uh, one of the first was the increased emphasis on un universal enrollment and retention, uh, increased enrollment rates across the country in primary and secondary education. And uh, one of the biggest uh, breakthroughs in education that has happened in developing countries like India is uh, the enrollment rates increased in primary and secondary schools, uh, which continues till date. Uh, thanks to the positive policy directions provided by the National Policy on Education. To ensure that all schools had sufficient resources for teaching, Operation Blackboard was launched to provide essential facilities to remote schools such as blackboards, toys, charts, school libraries and at least three teachers. So, uh, educational resources uh, started uh, being provided to uh, schools. There was a call for a national system of education with standards which led to among other things establishment of the very successful Jawahar Navodaya Vidyalayas which are run by the union government and catering to children predominantly from rural areas. The national policy on education also helped uh, encourage adoption of technological solutions in teaching and learning methods. It led to the creation of a new uh, national curricular framework in the year 1988. Uh, there was establishment of NCTE or the National Council of Teacher Education, uh, various district institutes of education and training diet were established for pre and in service teacher training. The first diet was established in Tamil Nadu in 1988 and questions of social justice in educational access and attainment came to the forefront of education policy issues and received greater importance than it was and than it received ever before. 
Now, in this context, the uh, Acharya Ramamurthy Commission of 1990 also needs uh, some emphasis, uh, both from a political angle as well as a social justice angle. In 1989, the Congress led government was defeated and the National Front government came into power in India under the Prime Ministership of VP Singh. As their election manifesto, they pledged a review of the national education policy. Uh, and the commission was appointed to review the 1986 national policy on education. Uh, education by now being a subject of the concurrent list, there were some regional grievances with the 1986 NPE, which some saw as too centralized and were not appreciative of regional contexts. So, as the National Front was a coalition of regional parties, uh, there was a pressure to review the 1986 uh, national policy of education. And some of the important uh, guidelines provided by the Ramamurthy Commission, also known as the Ramamurthy Review Committee, was uh, guided by the concerns of equity and social justice, decentralization of education management at all levels, establishment of a, a participative educational order, empowerment of work, inculcation of values indispensable for creation of an enlightened human society and so on. Now, in this uh, context, the uh, Central Advisory Board of Education on National Education Policy uh, of 1990 also uh, needs uh, some emphasis. This was appointed to carefully consider the recommendations of the Ramamurthy Committee and concurrently review the implementation of the 1986 National Policy of Education. And uh, this uh, CABE committee or the Central Advisory Board of Education committee was also known as the Jandhan Ready uh, Committee. And uh, some of the major recommendations of this uh, committee was as follows. The Navodaya Vidyalayas, the committee suggested that the Navodaya Vidyalaya scheme should continue and a Navodaya Vidyalaya should be set up in each district in India. The early childhood care uh, uh, education and article 45 um, the scope of Article 45 uh, was uh, expanded to cover early childhood education and care. Uh, constitutional amendment for right to education received some attention. The committee decided that there is no need for a constitutional amendment to make education a fundamental right and that operational blackboard will suffice to universalize elementary education. Uh, similarly, vocational education streams at the plus 2 level was sought to be strengthened and wherever possible vocational education modules were sought to be introduced from class 9 onwards. On the heels of the uh, READY committee, the program of action for the national policy on uh, education of 1986 was revised and the program of action was evolved through a consensual process by which the 1986 national policy of education was made. Uh, some of the key points of the program of action that uh, was introduced in 1992 was inclusion of class 12 in schools allowing students to study class 12 in either schools or colleges, expansion of Operation Blackboard and its extension to the upper primary level, an autonomous commission for higher education was proposed. There was a commitment made for allocation of 6 percent of national income towards education. We will come to this uh, in the uh, last part of our uh, lesson today where uh, it is important to be pointed out that based upon the recommendations of the National Policy of Education 1986 and the program of action of the early 1990s, there was a commitment made for allocation of 6 percent of national income towards education. It was also uh, uh, discussed that non-formal education should be made available to girl children, especially for age group of 15 to 35 years. Special provisions were made for SCSTs and OBCs and minorities in the form of midday meals, stationery, books, etc. Efforts were uh, made for backward minorities, uh, providing them hostel facilities, polytechnic education and so on. And there was a commitment towards establishment of Anganwadis and Balwadis for early childhood care and education. Now, in uh, 1994, the district primary education program gained momentum. It was a centrally sponsored scheme that was launched to revitalize the primary education system and achieve universalization of elementary education. The objectives were to provide access to all children to primary education and to reduce overall dropouts in primary education. Uh, 
and to increase achievement levels by 25 percentage points or more above a baseline. Uh, it was a form of decentralized uh, policy formulation where districts uh, were uh, asked to choose their own priority targets and district level plans for educational development was drawn for a period of 6 to 7 years and outlays and allocations for each year were made uh, based on the performance of the previous year. Uh, management information system was developed to monitor progress and this was a major step taken under DPEP. Uh, so, there were district information system for education was created to serve as MIS for DPEP. Now, it is to be noted that the early 1990s uh, had already begun uh, some of the important uh, implementation with respect to uh, digitally tracking uh, the education achievements at the district level. The district primary education program was one of the important initiative. As part of this lesson, I have not gone into the details of the political economy of each of these uh, policies uh, that were introduced uh, in the 1990s. However, an interested learner might be willing to take up some of the political economy issues that are also discussed in the literature. Uh, particularly when the economy opened up in 1991 and the various kinds of initiatives that started as part of the education intervention at the district level in India. Now, let us also pay some attention to the Sarva Siksha Abhiyan of 2002, the 86th amendment of the Indian constitution uh, article 21a uh, made free and compulsory education a fundamental right for children between the ages of 6 and 14. Uh, the district primary education uh, program uh, was not designed to enforce the right to education as defined by the 86th amendment and was meant only for classes 1 to 5 and therefore, the Sarva Siksha Abhiyan was launched to fulfill the right to education uh, with a view to universalizing elementary education in a time bound manner. So, what were the mandates of Sarva Siksha Abhiyan? It was much broader than the DPEP and it included establishment of new schools in remote habitations, strengthening existing schooling infrastructure, managing maintenance grants and school improvement grants, providing free uniforms and textbooks, providing for and increasing the strength of teachers, promotion of girls education, promotion of education of children with special needs. Uh, strengthening the capacity and skills of existing school teachers through extensive training, uh, grant for teaching learning materials and so on. And in 2018, the Sarva Siksha Abhiyan was merged with the Rashtriya Madhyamik Siksha Abhiyan to form the Samagra Siksha Abhiyan which is currently in operation in India. In this context, the uh, Right to Education Act also needs emphasis which came up in 2009. The Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act or uh, the Right to Education Act was passed which uh, described the modalities under which free and compulsory education was to be achieved for all children in India between the ages of 6 and 14 in line with appropriate methods, community participation and accountability. What were the major provisions of the Right to Education Act? Free and compulsory education between 6 and 14 years for all children. Reservation of seats uh, 25 percent in private schools for children from disadvantaged groups and weaker sections of society, prohibition of donations and capitation fees to schools, prohibition of screening of children before admission to schools uh, which was an important uh, initiative where all children uh, between the age of uh, 6 and 14 were to be admitted into schools age appropriate admission to grades of children who had not been admitted to school or did not complete elementary education, quality and infrastructure standards for schools was emphasized, mandatory prescription of qualifications for teachers, formation of school management committees from among parents of stu students and other stakeholders, prohibition of physical punishment of children and formation of school development plan by school management committees. So, uh, right from the uh, early part of the 1990s uh, to the uh, 2000s, the major focus was on uh, providing more and more uh, strengthening uh, provisions uh, within the policy discourse to be able to bring more and more children into schools and increase enrollment in uh, schooling as far as India is concerned. So, what we discussed in the beginning of the lesson with regard to the neoliberal policy framework 
or the classical economic liberalism framework which asked for the withdrawal of the state and bring in more market based reforms in the context of India as far as um, primary education and elementary education is concerned we see that uh, the provision of education by the state has been very strong right from the uh, 1960s to the 1980s and the 1968 and the 1986 education policy had a lot to contribute with regard to the improvement of uh, primary and elementary education is concerned. It was only in 2020 after uh, three decades that a new education policy was adopted uh, aligning with the sustainable development goals uh, 2030 agenda. Uh, the process for developing a new education policy began in 2015 with a committee under the uh, former cabinet secretary TSR Subramaniam and a draft NEP was submitted by a panel uh, Krishna Swami Kasturi Rangan who is the former chief of ISRO. After a rigorous bottom up consultation process involving all levels of government the final national education policy was adopted. The national education policy of 2020 suggested many novel provisions. In place of the existing 10 plus 2 structure, NEP 2020 has envisioned a 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 structure where the first stage called the foundational stage involves 3 years of early childhood education and uh, 2 years of primary education for children aged 3 to 8. The preparatory stage would last 3 years and involves uh, classes 3 to 5 for children aged 8 to 11. The middle stage would last 3 years and involves classes 6 to 8 for children aged 11 to 14. And the secondary stage would last 4 years and involve classes 9 to 12 for children aged 14 to 18. As the uh, foundational stage involves both pre-primary, early childhood and primary classes, teachers teaching at this stage must be trained for addressing all the needs specific to the age group and the curriculum should similarly be designed as a single continuum without making pre-primary or early childhood education a downward extension of primary schooling. Uh, with uh, excessive attention to reading, writing and uh, numbers. Um, when we discuss the annual state of education report in the later classes, we will see the importance of these policy frameworks focusing on early childhood education and primary education and why uh, the education policy needs also to be understood within the uh, country context. Uh, quality education for all children between 3 to 6 years of age was emphasized. The NCR is to develop the national curricular and pedagogical framework for early childhood care and education where there is a lot of work currently. There is again a commitment to spend 6 percent of GDP on education and the medium of instruction up to grade 5 to be a regional language preferably the mother tongue. Uh, progress tracking of students with examinations in classes 3, 5 and 8. Commitment to phase out affiliation of colleges to universities in the next 15 years, setting up of a higher educational commission of India, discontinuation of MPhil degree, establishment of national research foundation and creation of an academic bank of credit where credit earned by students in higher education can be recorded and used for awarding degrees. Now in this context, uh, the Committee on Higher Education of 2009 uh, can be discussed uh, which provided some kind of policy focus and direction to higher education in India. In 2009, the union government set up a committee for examining reforms of higher education known as the Yashpal uh, Committee um, and the major recommendations of the Yashpal Committee was that all universities must be teaching come research universities. Uh, there was a felt need to prevent isolation of study to engineering and management like the IITs and IIMs must also produce uh, scholars in other domains like linguistics, literature, political science, etc. The uh, minimum set of occupational exposure was to be made compulsory for all students irrespective of discipline in the form of internships with evaluation. There was a need to expose students at the undergraduate level to various disciplines like the humanities and social sciences. Uh, single discipline or specialized universities must not be created and all universities must have mandatory undergraduate programs. Teacher training for all levels of school education must be carried out by institutions of higher education.
So, in this evolution of education policy, there are of course various uh, dis other discussions, committees, commissions and reports on education in India that needs to be discussed. However, due to uh, the paucity of time and also because it falls beyond the scope of this uh, course on economics of health and education, it will not be possible for us to discuss all of these uh, committees and commissions and reports. However, some of the important ones that an interested learner may uh, look into are as follows. The Srimali Committee Report of 1954, which was a committee on higher education for rural areas. The Durga Bai Desh Book Committee of 1958, which focused on women's education. Uh, there was a committee in 1960, uh, which was a UGC Review Committee on Education. Uh, then uh, the Meena Swaminathan Committee uh, Study Group on Development of Preschool Child. Uh, there was a Shukla Committee in 1972 with a National Committee on 10 plus 2 plus 3 Education. Uh, then there were other, the National Knowledge Commission of 2007 and so on. Now, in this uh, context, let me also, uh, while we are discussing education policy and also we are discussing the, that in the current socio-economic climate, education policy in many countries across the world, including India, has followed the framework of neoliberal economics or classical economic liberalism uh, framework of minimum state interference and more and more market oriented reforms. In this context, it will be useful to look at some of the um, uh, estimates surrounding India. So, if you look at the public expenditure on education as a percentage of GDP and if you can recall that even the national policy of education of 1986. Uh, talked about contribution of 6 percent of GDP, a national income being spent on education. Uh, the 2020 national policy on education also uh, sort of recommitted or uh, stressed importance on this. Uh, India has still not reached the target of 6 percent GDP to be invested in public education after more than three decades of the target year when it was started in 1985-86. Between 2008-9 and 1920, the public expenditure on education as a share of GDP ranged between 3.6% uh, to 4.3%. So, we are the 6% uh, GDP is still elusive for India. Now, if you look at the uh, share of uh, state governments and union government in public expenditure on education, you will see that the states are the primary spenders and central share includes schemes fully funded by center or central share of uh, central sponsored schemes and other central grants. So, the purple colors here are the state share on uh, public on education in India and the uh, pink ones are the central share on education in India. So, between 14, 15 and 20, 20, 21 if you have to because we do understand that education is in the concurrent list and uh, while the national government provides uh, the guidelines with regard to how education policy, uh, what are the kinds of education policy that needs to be followed in India, the states uh, do the implementation. So, it is in this context that it is important to understand that the share of uh, state government and union government in public expenditure and education shows that the states are the primary spenders as far as education in India is concerned. Similarly, if you look at overall public expenditure, uh, most spending in India is on elementary and secondary education um, and adult education and technical education uh, also receives about 21 percent of the share. Uh, university and higher education is about uh, 13 percent. Uh, so, two-thirds of overall expenditure on education is spent on schools. States are the primary spenders uh, of uh, school education and the state share also varies across uh, the states. Uh, if you have to look at the sources of public uh, funding, there are central sector schemes and there are centrally sponsored schemes. Central sector schemes are 100 percent funded by union government. They are designed and implemented by the union government ministry mainly on subjects in the union list. And then there are centrally sponsored schemes which are financial participation by unions and states and they are designed by union government but implemented by state government and subjects from state list or concurrent list qualify to be funded by the centrally sponsored schemes. 
and the importance of the centrally sponsored schemes also needs to be understood. The rationale is equalization to ensure provision of minimum standards of public services to all uh, citizens and supplement states development initiative here and it has a focused goal with a mission mode approach to providing progress in uh, education in the country. Since we discussed about the recent uh, Samagra Shiksha Abhiyan, uh, some of the scheme objectives of the Samagra Shiksha uh, is that it is an integrated scheme for school education to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education from preschool to senior secondary and the goal is to achieve universalization of school education from pre-primary to higher secondary levels and the states have flexibility to prioritize between elementary, secondary and teacher education and it acts as a vehicle to implement the NEP 2020 and the Right to Education Act of uh, 2009. The Samagra Shiksha encapsulates the Sarva Siksha Abhiyan, the Rashtriya Madhyamik Siksha Abhiyan and the teacher's education. So, what we have done as part of today's class is to understand the general contours within which education policy uh, with a focus on India's education policy that needs to be understood. Uh, we saw that uh, in the current socio-economic climate, new neoliberalism framework is largely followed with respect to education policy in almost all countries across the world including India. And the neoliberalism as a policy framework focuses on uh, the pursuit of individual interests with market oriented reforms. And the idea that individual pursuit of individual interests also aligns with the interests of the society as a whole. It uh, calls for uh, less interference of the state and more uh, market oriented reforms in uh, provision of education. In the context of economics of education policy, uh, I discussed uh, very briefly the public choice theory and uh, the uh, transaction cost theory which uh, helps us to understand uh, the uh, framework within which uh, the management principles are uh, introduced for provision of education services in the country, uh, in a, um, education services within the larger framework of neoliberalism or classical economic liberalism. In the context of India, we uh, understood how education policy has evolved right from the 1950s onwards, where the focus uh, started being on uh, primary and secondary education. The movement towards providing a nationalized system of education uh, started in the 1980s with the 1986 education policy. Between the 1986 education policy and the 2020 education policy, there was a large gap of almost three decades where various other kinds of policy measures were introduced with focus on increasing enrollments in uh, primary and secondary schools, also in the focus on uh, providing university education. Uh, major changes uh, with regard to uh, the system of education has uh, been uh, proposed in the 2020 national education policy and it remains to be seen how the national education policy uh, is implemented at, uh, in the states because uh, as you have seen that the states are the major spenders as far as education is concerned. Uh, education is in the concurrent list while well, the national uh, government provides policy directions, implementation is to be done by the states and therefore, the uh, education policy within the country uh, has a lot uh, to uh, draw from as far as the state governments are concerned. For this class, the major text that I have used to understand neoliberalism in education policy is Education and Economics, Disciplinary Evolution and Policy Discourse by Somen Chattopadhyay, 2014. It is a book from Oxford University Press and there are various other references that I have used to uh, get the information on the national education policy uh, and uh, learners are requested to go through some of these uh, in more detail if interested. Uh, with this, let me end today's class. See you in the next class. Thank you.